Hello YouTube listeners and welcome to this weird sort of interview thing that I've decided to do. Uh, I'm Scott Ampleford and I'm currently sat down with musician and composer Dominic Glynn, who's perhaps most well known for his work on Doctor Who in the 1980s, um, as well as being one of the few uh, lucky individuals um, asked to do an arrangement of the Doctor Who theme. So let's get on with it. So first of all, of course, I want to sort of talk a bit about your your musical background. Mm -hmm. um, sort of take us take me through sort of how how you got started. Did you have any sort of classical training or? No, I mean I am pretty much self-taught. Um, I had a minimal amount of training in the sense that for about a year I I sort of rather reluctantly learnt the violin at school. Um, and that was because I really wanted to learn the double bass and I think my parents couldn't afford to buy a double bass. They said, if you're any good at the violin, you can work your way up. <laughs> so, uh, it's obviously, it's got four strings and it's from the same family. I think they thought there was a connection there, uh, but I wasn't very good at the violin and uh, that wasn't really my true love, you know, and I, we had a piano at home and because other members of my family did play the piano um, uh, from a more trained um you know background and uh but i just wanted to plonk around on the piano and make up my own tunes so even from a very young age i just wanted to make up my own tunes um and that's really how i sort of got going with it and then after having making up my own tunes for a while at home i found other friends at school wanted to do the same sort of thing but they play guitar or they play drums or whatever so we started a band and um you know that's my background is 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 a band basically you know i was keyboard player in a group oh great it sounds like you and i have had actually a very similar sort of beginning uh, my oh. first instrument was also violin right um which um i gave up because <laughs> because i got bored of the teacher oh, right. um, yeah. and uh and then after that it was uh it was keyboards my family never had a piano but we uh my grandma was a uh, one of those um she was mad about car boot sales Mm -hmm. And so I remember she bought these sort of Bon Tempe um, sort of organ things, you know, with a fan. Okay, yeah. And mm -hmm. I was picking tunes on that. And sort of that's how I sort of started doing that. And then by the time I was in high school, I, I was in a band. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so it, it does seem that we've come from some similar backgrounds, which, which is good because it means that we can sort of have some back and forth during this and, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So obviously sort of the first big job that um, you'd be known for was, of course, Doctor Who. Um, yeah. Not only did you get a job composing um, the uh, the incidental music, as it was known then, mm -hmm. um, and um, some of which is sort of completely unforgettable to me. I mean, I've... Um, uh, Trial of a Time Lord was the very first Doctor Who that I bought on VHS. Ah. And... Uh, I just remember putting it on, having seen some stuff on TV before and looking a bit shonky and sounding a bit shonky. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you put the Trial of the Time Lord on and the very first thing you hear after your cracking arrangement of the theme is um, that huge sort of organ and that wonderful um, visual as well of the, of the space yeah. station. And I just mm -hmm. remember looking at that and thinking, okay, so Doctor Who stepped up a notch. And obviously music does that, doesn't it? You know. Mm -hmm. It, it can sort of elevate something that perhaps didn't look so good in the first place. So, yeah. um, how exactly did that come about? You know, if that's sort of if you've gone from being in bands to all of a sudden getting a gig on Doctor Who. Um, aside from being in a band, I obviously had a few synthesizers and equipment in my room at home, and I just used to make up my own recordings and stick them. On. I used to have a, a Porter Studio cassette Porter Studio, so I'd do these little crappy multi-tracks and um just build up my own little tunes and um i i knew that i was in a band but we weren't it became clear after a while that being in a band was not actually going to be my career because we were not we were not cutting it we weren't actually getting a record deal that was getting us somewhere and all this sort of thing so i thought well i i really have always loved tv music i'm going to try and pursue that as a is you know, a career rather than the band side of things so i just started writing letters up to people and um, there aren't that many opportunities for, well, sorry, there weren't that many opportunities for electronic music in TV. Naturally, Doctor Who is a good place to sort of aim my um, my looking for work. So I wrote off to John Nathan Turner and a few other producers, but John Nathan Turner was the one 
producer doctor at the time who um who sort of expressed an interest and so he, he listened to demo tapes that i sent him and after a couple of demo tapes he said i'd like to offer you the job oh great and so when you got that job was it the incidental music and then they said oh would you like to have a go at the theme or sort of yeah. how did that come about yeah, it was four episodes of Incidental Music, which was the first four of Trial of a Time Lord. And that was the first thing I got commissioned to do. Um, and to be honest, I can't remember the, quite how this worked, whether I'd actually finished an episode or whether I'd, I don't think, I have a feeling I hadn't even started writing an episode before John then rang up and said, would you like to have a go at redoing the theme tune? Um, it was a, that was a last minute thing. Um, as far as I was aware, I was just doing Incidental Music and I was, I had the script and I was preparing what I was going to do and all this sort of thing. And then right, as I say, right at the last minute, uh, I had this call saying, would you have a go at doing the theme tune? But it was basically incidentals I was supposed to be working on the show for. And um, as far as your, your, your process when, when, um, when looking at uh, the, the visuals, obviously you'd have been given uh, the episode on a roll of uh, videotape or something yep. along those lines. Um, did you at the time have any sort of technology that would help you with sort of sync work? Did you have any sort of click track sort of making stuff? Did you have a, a sequencer? How exactly did the process? Well, no, I mean, it's interesting in a way because I'm, my my work in TV music kind of sort of spanned a lot of changes in technology. So um, when I first started, in other words, the first four episodes of uh, Trial of a Time Lord, I had no synchronization um, facility at all. Um, the very first piece of music that you wrote, that you mentioned earlier, the, the opening um, theme, I'd written initially not to picture. I'd written it as a as a, a demo piece for, for John. After I sent him a couple of demo t tapes, then he said, I think I want you to do this. I just want to send you a bit of script and I'd like you to s score this bit of script. So he sent me the opening uh, pages of Trial of the Time Lord, which was the big description of the space station and everything. But that wasn't written to picture uh, initially. Uh, the demo version of it wasn't anyway. So I just had to imagine it from the, the script and create that piece of music. When it came down to actually getting the VHS tape, which was the finished um, visuals. Obviously, I had to amend it and get the length of it right and all that sort of thing. But there was no synchronizing going on at all. All it was was um, VHS tapes running in my domestic VHS uh, video machine at home, pressing play and looking at the time code, which was burnt at the bottom of the, of the videotape, uh, hours, minutes, seconds, frames, yeah. uh, and having had uh, discussions with the director um, in advance, working out that music needed to start at a certain point in the program and needed to come out at a net at that point, roughly, or it fade out at that point. Then the next cue would come in, and maybe a minute later, at four minutes thirty seconds or something, and and that would go on for two minutes. And so it was all done very much like that. So I had notes on a piece of paper, and I would literally look at the screen. And when the cue was going to start, I'd have to press play on my tape machine and hope that it would sync up. Sync up, yeah which it often did and more often than not it didn't <laughs> uh, particularly if you had a long queue you might find that the beginning because it was manual you might find the beginning yeah that's in time you know fine that's that's working but as time wore on over the two minute queue if there was something that had to be synchronized visually towards the end of the queue there's a good chance that it was out by you know half a second or something which you know, uh, okay, start again, rewind the tape, start again, because, you know, I needed to get those sync points correct. Um, obviously, there were ways around it in the sense that you could put a click, as you mentioned, so you could actually record a regular pulse that you could use to, um, to you know, connect you to things on the, on the screen. But there was no way at that point, certainly I had, couldn't afford any equipment that would enable that click track to be locked to the picture so it was a it was a slight help but not a massive help you know so a lot of it, so it was all played in by hand basically and the, the first probably the first definitely the first four episodes and i think the last two of that season which were um of the ultimate foe the last story of that that season that was all done played by hand and all synchronized visually by pressing play and stop and record and all that kind of thing it, it moved on uh, when I got a, uh, a commission the following year, but um, not massively. <laughs> Gradually it changed. 
Yeah, so um, to sort of talk about the technology that you were using, obviously you're saying it sort of spanned a couple of changes your career yeah. um, at the time. Um, so what, um, well, for a start, as, as a bit of a synth nut myself, I've got to ask what your first synth was. Do you want to see it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first keyboard, uh, my first keyboard was a... a an ill-advised purchase <laughs> it was called an insta piano because in my hometown there was like a sort of keyboard center and they sold not very good keyboards but you know not being a man of the world at the age of 20 19 18 probably 18 or something i just thought oh it's a keyboard piano and so it was like an electric piano it was a crappy sound and i ended up using there was like a piano preset and a harpsichord preset and uh, something else and the piano preset was so horrible I used to do everything on a harpsichord preset <laughs> anyway that was the first keyboard but the actual first synth was bought a year or so later uh, which is does this have a can you turn the camera around the other way on this no you can't on Skype can you anyway uh, it was a Korg 770 oh lovely which um, it wasn't a desperately um, popular synth to be honest um, and it's quite quirky and a bit odd. Um, dreadful at bass sounds, mm. got no bottom end, but really good at really squawky, dirty sounds actually. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I used that. I used that on a lot of Doctor Who stuff actually. So a lot of the, the synthier sounding Doctor Who stuff was that. Um, and obviously, when when you listen to. Um... Your, your Doctor Who scores as well. One of the other things that, that I always thought um, sort of at the time set it apart from yep. its predecessors was your use of percussion. You sort of, you clearly had some sort of drum machine or or some sort of drum sounds. What were you using to get those those sounds? Um, I had a, I had a Yamaha, I think it was called RX-21, I think it was. Um, very, very basic drum machine and um, yeah, I suppose it hadn't been used very much in the past on Doctor Who, but it was just a, I suppose it was just a sign of, again, it was a kind of sound that was coming more um, familiar to people to hear a drum machine. Well, um, yeah, yeah. And I don't think I was particularly thinking, oh, I'll use a drum machine because it sounds really contemporary. I think at the time, I will move on to this, but I didn't have a sampler um, and I didn't have a drummer handy. <laughs> And uh, it was just a, it was the, the the easiest way of getting something approximating a drum sound and a rhythm into the into the music. Um, it wasn't through any desire to sound very 1980s, you know, which it, in, in retrospect it did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're saying that obviously you you there was no sampler, there was there was no sort of way really to get a, an orchestral sound. When obviously Doctor Who today is scored pretty much fully orchestrally um, but did that at all cross your mind when when you were working on Doctor Who did did you uh, when you were sort of programming your synthesizers and things like that did you think oh well I'll do this so it sounds a bit more like an orchestra and yeah those... I, mean, I, uh, I did I, mean, I did get a sampler after the first season but um, but cer certainly when I was doing the first season um, my my aim with the Doctor Who music was to try and make it a little bit more cinematic. But I think that would probably be a fair way of putting at it. I, I felt that the problem with the music in Doctor Who um, in the pr years prior to when I started working on it is it had started to sound a bit disconnected from um, what people expected out of a big um, science fiction sort of adventure thriller series whatever it, it was a bit TV yeah and, uh, that was always the danger with electronic music that it could sound a bit small and I always thought that um, it was possible to make synthesized music that sounded filmic and so I was aiming to do that with it um, and yeah I had to do it without a sampler to start with I didn't ever want the music to be pure orchestral because that wasn't really where I came from. I came from a kind of electronic background, but I wanted it to be big. Um, and, you know, I felt that a, the, a lot of the music you heard in the early 80s on Doctor Who, you would never hear that in a film score. And I, uh, no. <laughs> thinking, why, why wouldn't you hear that in a film score? And what would they do different? So I was tempted to, to score it a bit more like a film than, than, than a, a BBC TV series. That was my aim. Great. Um, 
what you you know when you're saying about instrumentation i completely agree that sometimes what doctor who did need at the time musically was a quite a large kick in the pants to sort of get it yeah. moving again yeah um there are sort of you do sort of look at um some of the music from um before your time on the show and it does sort of seem a little bit stoic or sometimes it seems electronic for the sake of being electronic mm. so it almost is interesting a bit twee almost sometimes mm. yeah. yeah i think the the exception to the rule would probably have been um paddy kingsland um who would sort of step in with his uh, guitar every now and again yeah. and, and you would get some great stuff but and, i and also very experimental stuff which works as well i mean i think things like um malcolm clark's um sea devil score which a lot of people go well oh, i mean that's hard to listen to it is quite hard to sit down and listen to you know on your headphones on your day off but in context it's right for doctor oh, who it, it's it's absolutely perfect yeah. And um, I, I do think that um, in, in the new, uh, newer series that Murray Gold has been sort of taking cues from um, some composers from the past. I think you've just got to look at his work with the, the Silurians and using like a, a contrabassoon and things like that to try and get that, that sort of slightly dirty sort of sound. Like Dudley, Dudley Simpsonish. Exactly, very Dudley Simpsonish. Yeah. I had uh, I had the the pleasure of um, I, I I highly doubt you're familiar with my work, uh, but I composed the music for a, an animated web series called uh, Doctor Puppet. Oh and, my. Um, we've been sort of it's it's a primarily an eleventh Doctor story that sort of jumps back through time, and you get to meet obviously the various Doctors and the last. Um, episode of the series that we did um, was the 70s episode and so I did have the the pleasure of writing in the style of Dudley Simpson which was a great deal of fun and uh, you got I've got things like a baritone sax and um, Terrific, trumpets yeah. and things like that and it uh, it did give uh, Doctor Who a very um, a very sort of succinct identity I felt um, yeah and that, and that was the thing. I mean, some people knock it for looking and sounding a bit shonky, but at the same time, nothing sounded like it. No. And, um, That's what I, I miss about the Doctor Who soundtrack of now, is that it's no longer as innovative as it was. You know, as you say, you could hear a Doctor Who soundtrack and you knew it was Doctor Who, uh, whereas the, the sort of music you hear in Doctor Who now is kind of fairly generic film music, you know? Yeah. It's, I think it would be nice to get a little bit more of that kind of more experimentation in there, which, which you know. I do think it's coming. Yeah. I do think it's coming. The last the last season um, of Doctor Who did sort of split opinions somewhat, but I did notice how much electronics were was was going on, especially yeah. when the Daleks were concerned and things like that. There's some lovely yeah. little electronic stuff, and of course, they're acknowledging the past as well visually by using a lot of uh, model shots and things like that. Again, I was <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. I remember watching uh, Into the Dalek earlier, uh, well, last year, and. Uh, and going, hang on, those are the toy. I've got one of those toys. That's the remote control Dalek that they, you know. Yeah. Um, so, sort of, moving, uh, last sort of Doctor Who related question mm -hmm. is um, so you were, at the time, you were using, obviously, we've mentioned a drum machine to try mm -hmm. and. Um, was there anything perhaps that, you, in your mind at the time, that was perhaps thinking. Maybe it's not that you didn't want to use drums, but you wanted it to help lock a tempo um, because you were mentioning that you had no form of, of synchronization. Um, did you find that having a drum machine helped write the music in a not, certain way? Not initially because it wasn't locked to anything. Uh, um, it wasn't particularly, I wasn't using that as my rhythmic um, locking um, facility. That probably came I'm trying to think when I got, I did get a, a little Yamaha sequencer again, um, which was that for Dragonfire or it might have been later on. But then I did start locking the sequencer to the drum machine on occasion. I didn't use a massive amount of drum machine, but yeah, when I did, um, it would have been the first time I'd been locking stuff to MIDI. Um, in fact, because the first season, again, I wasn't even using MIDI other than, was I using MIDI at all? 
I don't think it was using, no, it wasn't using MIDI at all. So it was, everything was hand played and I was using the drum machine just because where else am I going to get a snare drum sound? <laughs> oh, the drum machine, you know, that, yeah. that really, it was a si sound source rather than anything else at that point. Um, I w just a, a quick aside there that I will say, having mentioned um, Dragonfire, mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I, I personally really enjoy about your Doctor Who music mm -hmm. is that you were writing themes for characters. Mm -hmm. um, and before this point, the, uh, there are really no themes in Doctor Who, perhaps with the exception of the master in the 70s had that wonderful little uh, doo -doo -doo, wobbly, hypnotising music. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the one thing that I remember watching, um, I think I must have always been somewhat, even at a very young age, must have been rather in tuned to uh, film and TV music. Yeah. Because I do remember seeing... Um, Trial of a Time Lord, and and hearing this wonderful tune that you'd written for the character of Glitz, oh, Salon yeah. Glitz, and then I do recall sort of coming back later, and he makes an appearance in Dragonfire, and hearing it again, and just yeah. thinking that is how you do it, that that is what it's done, and obviously yeah. I'm um, myself, I'm sort of very big on the on the light motif, and I'm sort of very yeah. old fashioned in that respect. Um, but moving on, um, sort of past Doctor Who, you sort of get involved more in um, library music or production music um, as yeah. it's depending on whereabouts in the country or the world you're in it, it, it tends to be called different things yeah, and yeah. Um, sort of when was it that you started doing that sort of music that sort of side of it yeah and sort of fortuitously for me it was a kind of crossover that happened around the time Doctor Who finished the production library music started for me uh, pretty much Around about the same time, really. And then the first project I was given um, to write for um, the production library was um, um, sound alikes of epic thriller, sci fi adventure films and TV themes. And so, it kind of, I think they just thought, oh, he'd be the man for that job. You know, and he's done Doctor Who, so he understands the genre. And so I got. Um, a commission to write 17 or 18 tracks that were in the style of very much in the style of um they called them sound alikes um of star wars batman um the ages of the lost art and in fact doctor who and so i had a lot of um so bizarrely i had to do a sound alike of the doctor who music which was um interesting so <laughs> all sorts of things like that and it was that was a fantastic training ground from my point of view because Although I tried to, to get a sort of cinematic feel for Doctor Who, I'd never really gone into the depths of orchestration that you had to understand for um, doing something that sounds like John Williams, for yeah. example. So, you know, you look at the, um, the theme to Star Wars, it's quite a complex piece of composition, you know, and I, I, as I say, I wasn't a trained musician. I certainly hadn't got any ex experience in orchestrating. It was a fantastic learning curve because I had to sit and listen really carefully. OK, what is going on here? How did that work? What's he done? And, and that taught me how to start orchestrating, in effect. Um, so, yeah, that was around about 1990, I suppose. Doctor Who ended 89. So, yeah, I think 1990, 89, 90 was when I started working on that project. And fortunately, I've been doing a lot of production library music ever since. And... So, because you've sort of been in um, this same line of work from the early 80s to the, the, the present day, means yeah. that you have a, a perspective on uh, technology sort of evolving and, and things like that. So, are there any important technological mind milestones in your career, a particular piece of equipment that you've got and you've thought, man, this is the dog's bollocks? And Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, could sort of list them well first of all midi which i as i said i started off not using midi it's not that midi didn't exist but it was only beginning to come in properly into the eight in the mid 80s really um so started off without midi then got midi wow you know fantastic one instrument can talk to another and things can be locked in time with each other um sampling uh, again sampling existed before i started working on doctor who but it was hugely exp expensive you know people had fair lights oh yeah cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to have you know um 
pretty ba relatively basic um, libraries of sounds compared to what you can get now. Um, it was out beyond the reach of someone like me, especially starting out. But but um, the Akai S900 came along, and that was sampling for the common man. <laughs> and um, uh, it was about £1,800, my first Akai S900 sampler, and it took one floppy disk, which had, I think, 1.4 megabytes of storage space on it. Um, and uh, so you, you had to just layer record so but you could get a, a you know to some extent believable sample of a real instrument or you could manipulate real instrument sounds to get something that still sounded quite organic but was also electronic that was the great thing about sampling so you could take a, a string sample and you could pitch it right down or something and it would still have that organic feel to it but it would sound ultimately incredibly weird um so i did i did a lot of that um the next thing would probably be um uh, computing. Now, I had a computer, but not until uh, probably the Happiness Patrol, I think, is when I got my Atari computer. And again, that's a whole leap forward because you've got much more opportunity to layer sound on top of each other. Um, whereas initially I was just using 8-track tape. Um, but once you've got computer technology and you're able to layer and you can use MIDI to record and record audio and all sorts of stuff, it starts to move on in leaps and bounds and you know jumping ahead somewhat now if i work on a film or a tv thing now i'm locked to picture with the computer so that's probably the the biggest the biggest change to people writing music for film or tv is the the amount of time it saves apart from anything else you know just you've got a window in your screen or you've got a separate monitor which has got the film on it and then you've got your um, your audio digital audio workstation whatever it is you're using i use logic pro that's running on the other window and you press play on the on logic and the film starts and you press stop and the film stops you know if i'd had that 30 25 30 years ago wow you know i wouldn't have i just wouldn't have been able to believe that was possible um there was a thing called center time code dat which was available to people with big resources because yeah. again very very expensive and that did give you a, a form of synchronization but it was all terribly clunky and complicated but uh but that would be the biggest biggest change to, to you know working when i started and, and working now and with this sort of uh computer sequencing coming about and and sort of the one thing that I remember thinking when I first got a hold of a computer, um, just for the record, I also use Logic as well um, right. as my as my thing. But obviously, I started in in GarageBand and things like that. But even before GarageBand, I was using what's it called, Audacity. Oh yeah, yeah. Which is, for all intents and purposes, just a a, a, a tape machine. That's all it yeah. really does is record. Yeah. Mm. And so I found that. Uh, well, me personally, I found that when I started moving from recording my first synthesizer, which was a, a micro Korg, and just my, my, my piano, just a Roland sort of home piano thing, uh, and I switched into uh, using MIDI and GarageBand and things like that, mm. that um, did you find personally that, that the style of your music was changing? Did you find you were writing things that you you wouldn't or maybe couldn't write before yeah definitely and particularly when i started because i was using um creator oh no to, maybe to start with i was using cubase actually yeah. um yeah i didn't particularly like Cubase, but i think it was the first um sequence i was using on a computer and um it tended to make you work in blocks uh, as did and then i went on to c lab creator which ended up being logic um, but they all, to, to some extent, work in a similar way, and they they tended to make you work in, you know, you loop things, which you'd, you'd never do that when you're normally writing. But you know, they they just because it's so easy, you can get a little line going, and then you can press a loop, and then that loop keeps going, and you think, well, this is working well, and I can add something over the top of that. And it's in a way, it's a sort of lazy way of writing, but we all do it, and and a, and a whole genre of music has come out of it, which is things like dance music. It's all based around loops. Um, but we didn't have loops when we were starting. When you're doing it on tape, there's no such thing as other than a tape loop. And um, and certainly writing music for things like Doctor Who, your time frame is so short, you haven't got time to mess around too much with 
experimenting with tape loops and all that sort of thing. Um, so very often you do whatever was the quickest thing to get the job done because you've only got another, oh, I've got to get this in by the end of today. You know, how am I going to do this? So, um, yeah, probably loops, I would say, would be the biggest thing that meant you worked differently when you worked with a computer. Um, Whether or not noticeable to the end user, I don't know. But de definitely from the worker's point, working point of view, that was a big change. Um, when you mentioned loops there, um, there was a, a phrase that um, that actually is is very pertinent to um, my dissertation, mm -hmm. um, which was um, lazy. There was there was mm -hmm. a, you used the word lazy, and that's really what I'm trying to sort of get to the heart of. And obviously, I'm going to put, be the first to put my hand up and say I obviously loop things. Well, and I, Yes, yeah, and, and yeah. do this, that, and everything else. Of course, I do. You know, I've uh, one of my synths I've got is a is a uh, Roland Juno Six, which I use for bass lines all the time because it's got an arpeggiator, and I can just yeah. press a button and it will go dum 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 dum. That was dum. my second synth, by the way. Oh, great! Yeah. Um, I think technically it was my second synth as well. <laughs> okay. um, so yeah, I've just just so, so for your records, I've got my. Juno 6, I've got a DX7, which is sort of on its way out. It's not really working anymore. And then I've got a, um, a modular system um, oh. made by uh, synthesizers.com, um, right. which is sort of in the format of the old Moog ones. So right. right. Excuse the messy desk, but you can... Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I strongly recommend them. They're actually a lot cheaper than you might think. Yeah, um, wow. Hmm. Um, but yes, so what I was sort of wanting to explore was, um, I'm not sure it would be fair exactly to say that, that being able to loop things is really that lazy, because at the end of the day, the way that you and I are talking about it is you come up with an idea and loop the idea. So at the end of the day, you're still composing oh, an yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, but what I've sort of found is that obviously computing power is now very, very cheap. Um, and so there are there are probably more musicians or you know aspiring musicians out there making music than there ever has been before mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if you sort of keep up to date on, on sort of the newest technology and, and software and things like that but uh, have you found perhaps that because um, of this huge sort of influx of new musicians that you've got people like software developers and technology manufacturers making mm -hmm. things that are deliberately easy to use mm. um, the, off the top of my head I can think of there's a percussion library called Damage and there's something called Action Strings that are basically loop libraries of pre-recorded ostinatos mm -hmm. and um, I suppose my question is do you think that these sorts of um, developments are making composers lazy? It's such a difficult question because, um, you know, in black and white terms, you can say, yes, it is, it, it is making them lazy. But at the same time, you know, nobody can afford to pay composers the way they used to pay composers. So the amount of time it takes a composer to score something, um, the chances are they really haven't got the time or, or the budget to do it in that time. And so, Ultimately, everyone is striving to get the best possible end result because that's all that matters as far as the director is concerned or whoever has commissioned you. You just have to get the best end result. It has to be the closest to what's in their head. And um, yes, if it involves using um, some pre-looped, whatever it is, you know, almost it's fair game. As long as you're not just, you know, painting by numbers. Um, there, there may be an element of painting by numbers in what you do, but you have to make it your own. I think that's the key to it. If you use just Apple loops in everything and you didn't do anything with them and you just laid one thing on top of the other, I might say yeah, that's more than a bit lazy. It's boring and um, and everything's going to end up sounding the same. You know, this is the other thing. Oh, you don't want to start hearing the same loops in everybody's music. You know, that would be sad. Um, I think it's a matter of getting the balance right. I know when I'm working on things, uh, I'm using libraries that um, provide elements that sometimes are, you know, pre 
composed almost in the sense you might get a pre-composed crescendo or something when you just need a, I just need a crescendo that is a believable crescendo or something with a bit of movement in it and and you know you probably could program it in given an awful lot of time and and a higher budget <laughs> but nobody can afford to give you that kind of budget I say nobody it's it's rare so you know it's it's part of how it works now and one of the things that i do get interested in is new libraries well okay what have we got now new sounds there's always new sounds and what can i do with those new sounds and how can i build them into what i'm composing you know uh, elements from here and elements from there i think that's probably the key to it basically marvelous um so i suppose the um the best way to to finish this interview um mm -hmm. would be to uh, ask you about um, scores that you felt have influenced you as a composer throughout your career. Perhaps pick mm. uh, one particular film score per decade. Blimey, should have given me advance warning on that one. <laughs> um, I don't think I, to be honest, I couldn't narrow it down to like one a decade. I can just say that certain things have influenced me. I mean, I would say things like certainly in my youth, I was. I just loved the music of John Barry. And so I loved it when he wrote themes. I loved his, you know, introduction themes of Persuaders, for example, was just a classic television theme. And I was, was so influenced that, you know, you could write a great piece of music and it was a TV theme. And that's what I want to do. I want to write TV themes. Wow, you know, so the Persuaders, um, Edwin Astley, who wrote things like um, The Saint and uh, Department S, I just was so influenced by that kind of stuff. Um, then later on, we're probably talking about, and, and of course, John Barry with the Bond themes as well, and the Bond incidental music. Again, again, his orchestrations, I just used to sort of be in awe of. Um, then later on, looking more at the synthesized side of things, things like Blade Runner, which is a fantastic synthesized score but cinematic so we were talking earlier about you know cinematic scores and they don't have to be orchestral to sound filmic and Blade Runner was probably uh, one of the best examples of that I would say um, beyond that oh blimey how to narrow it down I, to be honest I couldn't narrow it down I've got so many film scores I, I love that have come later um, but my favourites very often combine elements of electronics and, and orchestral music and probably that's probably where my heart is really it's blending sounds in fact it's blending styles as well but that's what I get most interested in is what if you put that with that two things that maybe don't normally go together and you slot them together and find something new because that's normally how innovation comes about I think well, well thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview um, I think you've been a great deal more help than you probably think you have <laughs> Good. Uh, and um, it's just been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. No, no problem at all, Scott. And good luck with the dissertation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.